and we will start with an opening prayer. Dear Gracious Father in Heaven, we thank you again for this time that you have blessed us with. Be with us today as we look over, again, some of the same stories that we've read before, but from a different perspective. Um, and how that might affect our life today in the way in which we need to live to show Christ's love for us, and we can show that to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Chapter 13. Interesting enough, they should have just called this a chapter of parables, because I think that's all it is. Um, and before you guys got online... Um, Joanne pointed out, well, gee, they're the same parables that we've read before on some of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they must be important uh, for them to, to tell us all the time. Or my theory is God knows we need to be told again and again <laughs> and again um, the same story. So maybe we'll understand it at one time. Um, but... I put like the first question on there was before looking at the questions, did you, did you do that? Did you just read the chapter first? Yes. Yeah, I just did. Okay. Did. So, you know, to just kind of do, cause I was, I thought, well, maybe it's just a little different if we do, you know, process it. Cause that's what I did this time. I glanced at it and I thought, well, I'm just going to read it before I try to figure out questions. Um, so then I read it. And then I was thinking, well, I wonder if now, because if you read it all at once, you kind of get like the whole picture, right? Um, mm -hmm. So after you read it, was there a specific parable that like, the question two, that really clicked for you? Like, did something just all of a sudden like click in your mind? Like, I finally get it. The parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. What? What happened that made it click? Well, I finally realized what seed I am. <laughs> oh. The one in the thorns. Okay. Oh, so you took it, like, personally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That one was always so, conflicting. So, so like, what, okay. What seed am I? And I, I always actually thought I, not the thorns one, but I always thought maybe the one on the rocky ground. Okay. Was more me. Hmm. I'm the path first can I do on it? Yeah, but now that he described it, which is amazing, I'm the one <laughs> in the thorns. <laughs> you're you're the seed that's planted in and amongst the thorns. Yep. Okay. How about you said you did the same thing, Doug? Yep. Yeah, I was trying to figure out, make sure I didn't didn't try not to fall in any I'm sure at different times I fall into all those categories, so it's Okay, which one do I got to watch out for today? Yeah. Yeah, because it's interesting, right? I mean, I can read that story, and I could see myself being in all those categories. Like, when, but the in, then I thought to myself, you know, it's probably a good thing then that there, who's the sower then? What are, who's that person? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay. So, and, and I viewed it as someone, as another person, right? To me, I viewed it as a person who was sowing the seed, who was planting God's word, right? Okay, so for sure. For me, when I read it, I thought, you know, it's a good thing that for me, at least, that there's, con that everybody is constantly, you know, that the people who have the good fruit, that they're constantly sowing seed, right? It's not mm -hmm. like a one-time deal. At least that's how I read it, because I was thinking it's a good thing because when I was planted on the rocky ground and all of a sudden that seed was plucked away from me, what would have happened if that sower wouldn't have came back again the next year or the, or the next week for that matter? Um, for me, um, and then I thought to my you got transplanted, huh? What's that? You got transplanted. I got, yeah, I got, <laughs> I got transplanted. Like you know, the wind picked up and the seeds got 
threw back in the bag of the sower, and then they threw it out again. Um, <laughs> but for me, that's what I kind of looked at. Like, if, and I kind of look at like us as like the sowers, like we're the ones out there planting the seed, right? Like we're planting a seed through, you know, maybe a conversation that we have with someone. We might be planting a seed when we actually do something super scary and actually pray for someone right now when they're there. Um, you know, that's planting a seed, right? So at some time, just think if those people wouldn't have done that, especially like for you, Joanne, when you say, oh, I feel like I was planted in the thorny grounds. Well, what happens like when that happens, right? I mean, it pulls up. What if they uproot me? Am I just right. done? Am I thrown to the thing? You know, it's just cool to know that, you know, it takes a while. <laughs> the way I read it is it takes a while for the seed for me to actually be good soil. Um, and now we can look at it. And I think like you hit it, Doug, where you said, I see myself in all those situations, you know, and even in good soil, when we're out producing the fruit, you know, that we're supposed to, how many times do we end up falling back into one of them other categories? Um, but yeah, but, there, it, but there's also the good news that Christ came to uh, forgive us, you know, and that's, the good news is, hey, Christ is there for us. To, See, to that's not sins. fair. That's why you got good soil all around you, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I got good soil, but sometimes it's in a crack over here, and it's over here, and then I got this weed bed over here. Like, that's how my life is. But I need someone like Doug to kind of keep telling me, yeah, but dude, there's the good news. You know, remember. Remember this. You know? But I like the parable of the sower too, because um, that's a great one because he actually tells us what it means. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. like them parables when he just like tells the story and he says, well, go figure it out. And I'm like, uh, yeah, dude, you know who I am, right? I'm not figuring that out. Um. <laughs> well, and I think the parable of the sower also is a reminder to us as disciples that people we meet. And, you know, for us to be patient and, you know, that some of the things we say to people will fall on deaf ears. Some people will hear it and say, oh, you know, that speaks to me. But it, you know, so I, I think, I think it's also, um, that we need to be patient in in our discipling. Yeah, we never know how it's going to be received. Correct. Correct. We just need to be the sower, right? Like they that's describe right. it. You're you're throwing the seeds out, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what we're doing in that. And, the at, and yes, yes. So then, uh, like your question, your statement, Kath, kind of goes right into question three. Oh, well, I was going to tell you what one clicked for me was the okay. parable, of, parable of the weeds. Okay, that, why is that? Why is that? It's yeah. because as Christians, we live, we coexist with the weeds. And we have to have a strong root so that we can grow. Mm -hmm. Because... We're going to all, we're not going to be in a weed free field. We are going to be living in a world filled with temptation, um, evil, all those things. So we need to stay strong in that field ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to be strong, productive plants. Well, since you got that one. Let's jump to, and then you can answer question four for us, because oh. that clicks. So you should have the answer to this, because um, I don't. Um, but <laughs> so question four, how can the parable of the weeds 
teach us patience? Because I think it said something in there about that. If I could find my cheaters, maybe I could read the Bible a little better. Um, I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. They were well, tucked, under, tucked underneath there where I don't use them all the time. So, um. I, I actually think the one that teaches patience more for a disciple, this parable of the sower, you know, that I think I mentioned that we have to have patience and, you know, just keep, keep sowing the seeds. Um, or how about but, like, I mean, who's a gardener here? I'm uh, not a gardener, so I don't have yeah. any clue, right? Okay, yeah. so you guys are gardeners, right? So yeah. in in the parable of the weeds, because this is this like describes that, right? Because gardeners, you don't want the weeds in your thing, right? But right. he says, um, like at the end of verse 28, do you want us to go and pull them up? And he's talking yeah. about the weeds. And he says, no, because otherwise you might pull the weed up. So he's saying, like, be patient with the weeds and let them grow. That's how I kind of read that. That's where I got this from. Yeah. Question. Well, so, there is truth to that. I'm sure, you know, in the spring, you know, if you, my garden is a perennial garden. That's all I have. And some of the the plants that I have in their early stages look very much like weeds. So I have to wait until they get to a certain size before I start pulling the, the actual weeds because the okay. weeds look like the plants, <laughs> you know? So I, I have like to them kind of plants then. Yeah. So I have to wait. I can't just go out and pull every little green thing that I don't recognize in the spring. So I guess there's patience in the sense of that, because then once I can discern which is which, <laughs> so those weeds have gotten pretty doggone tall, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> I have to wait to make sure that the actual vegetable or fruit has a root before I can pull the weeds, like with carrots, because if I pull the weed when the carrots are this big and the weeds are this this big, the carrot comes out with it. Yeah. So I have to wait. So yeah. it is kind of in that sense of trying, yeah. like, you know, how does this kind of work and relate? And then when you say that and you explain like, well, if there's a weed and you pull it, carrot comes out. Yep. Now the carrot can't do its job. And I guess that would kind of be like the same for us, right? Abs yeah. That's yeah. what he's saying, you know, be careful with, you know, be patient with those around. Um, Ho hopefully I'm not one of those carrots that we have to be thinned out. <laughs> <laughs> um, nope, I don't think so. <laughs> so then let's go back from question four. Let's skip back a question because all this is about how do these parables help us in our life? So how might the parable of the sower, and then we'll throw in also the parable of the weeds, how can that help us? And I'm going to say this like statement, so don't get offended, um, in your ministry, because somewhere or other, you guys are doing ministry somewhere. That just, you know caring for others and like sharing God's message. That's ministry. Um, so how can these two parables help you? Because this is like the third time we've heard these, so we better start getting it because in John, we're probably going to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, right? How, do, how does this help us? I guess maybe it helps you recognize who people are and maybe what their needs are. Okay. So maybe to, like helping them in the sense of, are they a weed or are they a fruit or a carrot? Yeah. Or where was your seed planted? You know, the ground, right. So, the rocky ground or. And then um, maybe like that, that's a good point, right? Then if we realize that and we thought, well, geez, I thought they were here all the time and now they're gone. What does that mean to us? I mean, that means to me that I better get back out there because apparently 
the seed didn't take effect. And it'd be my job to go back out and like plant another seed. Um, hopefully with some miracle grow this time. <laughs> or maybe, <laughs> maybe find out why that soil is rocky. Is mm -hmm. it, is it soil that you can rake up the rocks and turn it into good soil? Yeah. So a good, and, like, and, and likewise, if it's thorny, you know, thorny ground, um, you know, why is that? You know, m there might be something that you can do to improve, to improve the chances of that seed uh, sprouting and taking root. So even though it fell on, on rocky ground or in the thorns, don't just write it off. Mm -hmm. you know? It's kind of like somebody, like Kathy, you follow me on Facebook, so you see many of my adventures that I mm -hmm. go on. And the one thing that always amazes me is when I'm off on my hikes and I'm doing all that stuff, and I just climb some, you know, big rocky cliff or something like that. And as I'm climbing, there's a rock face wall there, but there's a tree that's growing out of this rock. Yes. And it always brings me back to like this, like this little section, you know, if it's in good soil, it can grow. Mm -hmm. no matter what it like is in so it just it's always something when I see that lone tree that's growing out of a crack um it reminds me of this saying I think you said it it doesn't matter plant the seed just because it's rocky soil doesn't mean don't plant the seed plant the seed because right. you never that's know that's what my husband says for the garden he says it's all about quantity not quality just spread the seeds we may get some that aren't any good but we'll get some that are good yeah 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 right and that like re correlates right to this little story yeah you know so you don't plant the seed the trees aren't going to grow or the fruit's not going to grow yeah if you don't make any effort i mean like you say if you don't plant the seed how can something sprout mm-hmm um, so quantity of that type of thing, it kind of goes then to question number five. And again, I use this word ministry. That doesn't mean that you're a church worker. Um, but ministry comes in all sizes and I meant to say forms and like all sorts of different things. How do verses 31 to 33 reinforce that? It doesn't matter how small your faith is. You can still do amazing things with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the, the picture of the mustard seed. I don't know what a mustard tree looks like. I still kind of want to like actually see one once. Well, um, I, I, looked one, I looked at one on the internet. I saw one. Yes, it's, it's, they can, in, in the least they get quite large. I mean, he says like a tree and birds land on it. Yeah. So I'm like picturing a, like a tree. Well, funny it's more thing like is, a shrub, a isn't it? It's a big, it can be like a big shrub, yeah. Yeah, and very, very thick, very sturdy uh, stalk and, and, and leaves. Okay. So it would support the weight of a bird. Okay. Definitely. It's not the smallest seed anymore, though. What's that? No. It's not the smallest seed anymore. Really? What is? Well, all that I know would be like a carrot or lettuce seed. They're very tiny. Are they? They're almost they're almost microscopic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's why that's why when you plant them, you have to thin them out because you can't plant an individual seed in a you know you just take and you just sprinkle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
There are some seeds like mushrooms. They're they're you know they're invisible. You can't see it. You know. Yeah, so there's more. Right. Yeah. They also three M. They also say they treat me like a mushroom. You know, keep me in the dark and feed, feed me a bunch of bullshit. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Um, and then like there's that one and then i like the theory of like the yeast um okay. because of what yeast does to the dough i just think that and the way they described it about how the yeast has to work through all of it and i always remembered when like that one that comes to mind is brings me back to my um navy bake shop days um because we used to make like homemade cinnamon rolls. Um, every night we would make cinnamon rolls and donuts and bread. And they weren't like, you know, the small KitchenAid mixer type of thing. No. The, the amount of flour that we put in was typically 110 pounds. Um, that went into the mixing bowl. <laughs> and so then when I was reading this about the yeast, I thought, you know, that's kind of amazing because when it all starts, it's just this big lump of nothing in, in the mixing bowl when you get it all mixed together. But after you let it sit there, and literally the yeast, you, can, you know what that is, right? But you can actually, like how that yeast made that whole thing of dough like rise um, and grow. And I thought, well, yeah, that, we're kind of like that too, right? Um, when you get in, or the Holy Spirit's like that with us, right? When it gets in, pretty soon it's working through, and then you just continue to grow. So I, I think those were, I like both of those types of stories that kind of teach you about something that's small, but how yet it in, can impact and have so much power to do what it does. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, that's kind of like what it is. No matter what we do, we don't know what that little thing is that we're going to plant and how it's going to grow in someone. Um, so then verses 44 and 46, because um, it's weird, he had like the parable of the weeds and then they did the mustard seed and yeast and then he explained the weeds like we were supposed to go back. I don't know why they couldn't put that all together in one thing. But anyways, that's what he did. Apparently he's smart or something. Um, but then you Well, get... here's the reason why. Why? Why, Kathy? Please. Well, if you why. read if you read the black letters in mine in this case, you know, this is where where Jesus is in the boat preaching to the crowd. And so he's saying all these. And um, he, when it gets to the explanation of the parable of the weeds, then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us. Okay. So, so it's That's a little more the, of a storyline for me. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. But so, okay, so now we're back. So now we're back. So, um, you know, we had a couple parables where he actually then told us what they meant. Thank you very much. Um, but then we go to this one, um, which relates to question number six. Um, in verses 44 to 46, how much energy should be pursued when seeking the kingdom how does this little thing because i think for me you like what is the parable what is he trying to get at and to me that's what it was like how this tells us what how we should really pursue the kingdom so how does this demonstrate what type of energy we should have well i think in the first two the parable of the hidden treasure where a man found treasure in a field and he goes and sells all he has to buy that and the parable of the pearl of great value um the merchant who seeks pearls what he's saying is when you're seeking the heaven kingdom of heaven you have to go all in that has to be your 
the whole focus of your life. It's not a, a part-time job. Really? Yeah, it's really not a part-time job. can't do this job. on like Sunday morning? Huh? I can't just no, it's do not this just on like Sunday morning. morning. No, it's like Sunday morning and Thursday morning Bible class and Saturday morning Bible class that will be starting for the ladies on Zoom. And yeah, that it's not just something that you do uh, when it's convenient. You know, you don't take your metal detector out and go down to the beach. You know, just take it along with you when you're vacationing at the beach. <laughs> You know, yeah. Um, it, it, so, it's something that you have to you have to consciously seek. It's not going to just be handed over to you. I mean, it is in the sense that you've been baptized and and expressed faith in Jesus, and that he he came to Earth in the form of a human being and actually died like a human being does and then rose again so that we could attain eternal life. It's been given to us, but it's our job to also seek the knowledge that the Spirit can give us, the, the words of Jesus and what they teach us. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kathy, for like pointing out all my shortcomings. Oh, I know. It's, you know, well, and for you to say, well, my... if you're going to do this, you need to go all in and, you know. So, yeah, but Tim, you've, well, you, you are going all in. So my question, it's like. A, sometimes you lose the hand even when you go all in. Yeah. So it's like poking the bear, right? I mean, yeah. how do you explain this? What does that mean? How do you ministry to minister to someone else? That, that says that, right? We get it, right? Because we're talking about the book of Matthew. Right. We're reading through it. But how does that pertain to, how do you, you know, what would you do in the case of that when you're talking to, um, I'll refer to a guy named Jimmy, um, just because I've never ran across a Jim in my Bible study yet, so I'm safe. Um, but how do you refer to Well, isn't to there a, a letter Jimmy? to or by James in the... Uh, What's that? I said, isn't there... There's a book of James. We ain't talking book about Book of James. Now. So that'll be you know, that'll be months down the road. We ain't talking about him. Um, oh, <laughs> but okay. like how do you how do you <laughs> how do you explain how that? You explain to that to someone? Yeah. yeah. I mean that's like the whole thing, right? This Yeah, is, you know, I haven't figured that part out yet. Okay. Well, you know, get back to us. Yeah. And like next week you can like let us know the answer to Yeah. That. No. <laughs> But anyways, right, it's kind of, it just kind of tells us that, you know, go that, on. I mean, that it's, that it, that the kingdom of heaven is the greatest treasure that we could have in our lives. So do whatever you can to acquire it. Do whatever you can to acquire it. Yes, and, but, but some are called for different, different tasks. And some are prophets, some are missionaries, some are just supporters of the church too. So you can't be... Yes. I mean, we, we need them all, though. Yes, that's very true, Doug. But in, in your life, the life you lead can reflect, you know, you are a reflection of the Holy Spirit that's in you, of mm -hmm. Jesus and his words. So it behooves us to behave in a way, not be judgmental of people. Yes, you may not agree with what someone is doing but mm -hmm. still show them love. Um, you know, if you, just because you don't agree doesn't mean that you hate someone. Mm -hmm. It means that when you meet someone, you meet them with a smile and open welcoming arms. It, it you know. And, and, and a mask. That, huh? And a mask. And a mask, that's right. No <laughs> hugging, you know, elbow <laughs> bump or fist bump, you know, right now. Um, I am so looking forward to the day when I can once again hug people um, because I, I think I think that physical aspect of welcoming a person with a hug is show you know I mean because when you open your it's like a dog lying on its stomach and opening itself saying give me belly rubs you know you are in your most vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. 
when, when you take your arms away from this part of yourself and open them to someone else and bring them into your circle, um, you are being vulnerable. And I think that people, some people are resistant to that until they realize that you are not that you're sincere in your desire to welcome them into your life. So it may take a while before someone would receive a hug from you, but in many cases they do eventually one day, you know, they will hug you. So, yeah. um, so I think just as an everyday Christian, just try to live the best life that you can. And so yeah, that's part of yeah. that's part of your ministry, and that's going all in in that sense. Yeah. So we have another one, another parable of the net, um, and the question was, how is the parable? How might the parable of the net compare with the parable of the weeds? Sam Ting, man. What's that? It's the same thing. You just, in the uh, parable of the weeds, you know, wait until the it's time for harvest and we'll gather the weeds together, throw them out, and then we'll gather the, the, good, the good wheat. Um, with the fish, you pull up everything that you got in your net and you go through. Uh, this one, no, mm -mm. throw it back in. Oh, that's a good fish. Yeah. And that's what's going to happen on the Day of Judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And I hope, I hope I'm one of those nice, tasty, tasty groupers. It's also kind of like a warning, too, though. Oh, definitely. In what way, In what way Doug? Well, he's just trying to warn you that you uh, uh, don't be wicked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to kind of, you know, be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and for us, it, try, do, do, you, do your best, you know, and, and then again, for us, right, as we're out doing it, you know, cast the net in a big area and gather what you can, right? Maybe you're going to gather, maybe you get two or three or whatever, but that's kind of, I'm going to use Joanne as like an example. Um, right? This whole thing that we're doing right now <laughs> is like casting the net, something we never did before, right? We cast mm -hmm. the net way out and we pulled it in. And what did we do? We gathered good people, right? We would have never been able, if we wouldn't have thrown this Bible study thing like super wide, you know, we just, we wouldn't have Joanne. She wouldn't be there. And I wouldn't have a new friend. Yeah, and you wouldn't have a new friend. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I it's kind of an interest, you know, we just can't, you just got to, like, let that person grow, you know, as she alluded to the carrot. <laughs> That's going to stick with me, like, forever now. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you can't pull the weeds up, like, all the time. You got to, like, make sure everything has, like, a good root before you can do that. Um. So then, like, okay, Kathy is going to be, you know, Kathy alluded she's going to be a grouper. Fish, yeah. Right? Because that one's going to be kept. Um, mm -hmm. We found out then that Joanne was, like, planted in the thorny stuff, right? So, you know, what I mean, did we, we found out about Doug. What, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Doug. So, what have we found out? What are you? No, Sunny. But Dad, Dad, so, so bright. You called me Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like for me, the one thing that, like, if we were gonna do that, it would be I would be like that tree that's growing out of the rock face. Yeah. Right. Because I look at like my past, and I always think there is like no way that I should be here because of my past. There's just no way, but I'm like that tree that just 
grew out of a rock. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I was going to be a fish, I'd want to be a bullhead. But bullheads are, well, you are a bullhead. <laughs> bullheaded or? <laughs> you're bullheaded. Um, but typically bullheads are not considered good eating. Yes, they are. Yeah. Well, I know they are if you're willing to do all the work to get to that yeah. tasty See, You got to, again, you got to go all in when you're fishing yep. on a bullhead. Oh, yep. Southerns eat them all the time. They call, they call them different, Don. What they call them southern? Well, they call them catfish because usually catfish, they're yeah. bigger. But yeah. like you catch them little bullheads like this big at the yeah. bottom of the dam. Oh, oh, they, man, they, 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 down south, eat the little small ones too. What, what they, they call them? Um, I don't know, but I like them. So yeah. I want to be a bullhead when he pulls me up in the net. Okay. <laughs> Why would you be the seed on the rocky soil? Well, I wouldn't be the one on the rock. I'm, I'm like, I view myself as one who was planted on good soil, but in the sense of where it was, it was planted on rocky soil because at many times when the wind came, it would blow it away. But then it might blow it away down the rock a little bit to another crack, <laughs> you know, and then I'd grow. And then it was this constant thing of, you know, maybe I get knocked, maybe it would get knocked down a little bit or the rocks would ship and it would break it off, but it would blow it back down. But sooner or later. But what are you now? What are you now? Right. What am I that's now? Not now? I'm that tree that's growing out of the crack of the rock. Are you anticipating falling away? Nope. Cause those trees on those trees that grow on like, you know, you like big rock cliff. Yeah. And and I there's a it. and there's a tree and you're thinking, how how deep is that tree's roots that it can grow through a rock? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there are, yeah, and there are trees that propagate by sending out runners. Birch trees, for example, yeah, it's just, send out runners. And so it gets deep enough in there. So Tim is that tree, and he's gotten deep enough into that soil, and his roots have spread, and little seedling, or little, you know. Oh, man, I hope not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but no i just you want to be seedlings i just look at it and that every had one that was enough <laughs> yeah. i'm just like if i look at it as people look at me and they say there's no way that he should be that he should be doing this yeah um so i'm yeah. still connected to good soil i'm not worried about like the different ways in which they talk about like the wind being blown away I'm not worried about the birds eating me. Um, and I'm not worried about, you know, something else growing up and choking me out. Um, huh. But I'm not, like, I don't consider, like, my past, I don't consider, like, the perfect soil. Right? It's just, it was able to, like, grow through a whole bunch of junk um, to make it. <laughs> I see. I'm <laughs> I'm the tree that's growing in the compost center. <laughs> um, so that's chapter 13. Wow, that was like, it's like 20 after 11. So um, <laughs> we got chapter 14. Um, again, I think we alluded this before, so I'm still, maybe someone will shed some light for me. Um, John the Baptist, beheaded. Um, interesting concept that they throw that in here, um, which is why my question stated, what might be some thoughts as to why they placed those 12 verses right there? Still don't know. Me either. It's just an interesting thing. We get all this wonderful, glorious teaching, and then bam, dude's head's cut off. And yeah. then let's go back on to some more really good stuff. What's the purpose? He prevailed against the being rocky soil, and he he's shows a shining example. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I just to me it's just weird. Yeah. It might be one of the questions that I'm going to ask God when I get up there. And say all your questions will not be with you when you get up there. What's that? 
my understanding is any question you have now will be taken away from you and you will have no questions. No, I learned a really good thing at this funeral that I saw here. Um, it was Phil Thompson's funeral. Did you go to that, Kathy? No. He took, it's the coolest thing ever, and I so want to do this, but he had his, his coffin up there, and he had Sharpies and Post-it notes. And you could write on his casket all over with these Sharpies, mm -hmm. right? So you could, and, and then if you wanted answers, because his question was always like, he was the one who said, I'm going to ask God when I get there. So his theory at his like visitation was write a question on a post-it note and throw it in my coffin and I'll bring it to God when I get there. <laughs> oh, so, wow. On, at his funeral, it was amazing. He had stickers for the kids and then all sorts of colored Sharpies. And he probably had like a $10,000 casket, like some super really nice one. And it was just graffiti all over it like people were drawing on it kids were going up and putting stickers and then like his whole part here had post-it notes of questions mm -hmm. so it was like just one of the coolest things right mm -hmm. um wow so to me that's what i'm putting in my casket i want to know um <laughs> post-it notes <laughs> post-it notes yep <laughs> put it in a pocket and bury me with it and then i'll remember when i get there <laughs> to ask that question that's pretty cool um but it's there so i'm sure at some point we might figure it out um but then we talk about verses 13 to 21 that jesus feeds the five thousand. um and it's an we talked about this in a couple other ones but how can that story teach us about interruptions Because, like, the disciples weren't happy about it, were they? No. No. Um, but Jesus kind of was. I mean, he didn't seem to get, like, all uptight about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what can that teach us about interruptions? I wouldn't call that, that parallel really an interruption, though. I, don't, I think more of a... Or an inconvenience. Huh? Or an inconvenience. I mean, yeah, it's more of an object lesson. He's, he's giving us. A, I think it's more of an object lesson. You know, saying, "Hey, I can I can do these miracles." Yeah, it's a great thing. But did the disciples see it that way? I mean, no, I mean, how happy true. were they when he said that? Mm -hmm. I mean, there they I are. Think they're they're happy. Happy. What's that, Joanne? I didn't sense that they were unhappy about it. I guess. Oh, yeah. See, I read it as they were kind of perturbed about it. Like, what do we got to do this for? Like, mm -hmm. he says, feed them. And they're like, with what? You know, why do oh. we got to feed them? You know, and he's kind of like. Well, I, I don't see. I didn't read it that way. I read it more of, you know, we're we're out in the middle of nowhere. And not so much that why do we have to feed them? But these people must be hungry. I, I felt that they were, and it's been a long day. Um, they must be hungry and tired. So why don't we let them go and find, go back to their homes or, or wherever they might be able to find something to eat. And so I, I, I guess I wouldn't say that um, they were that the disciples were feeling particularly interrupted or inconvenienced. I think they actually had compassion on the crowd, but Jesus, in his wisdom and power, he said, "Well, we can take care of that." And so we have the miracle of the loaves and fishes, you know. Um, because I think at the time, you know, he wanted to be able to continue uh, ministering to the crowd. You know, because then, but then, yeah. See, I read it as a sense of me. 
I put oh. Tim in this equation, right? Oh. And I, I think to myself, I'm, I'm reading this and, you know, he did all this other stuff, all these other parables and all that. Um, and it says, you know, it's getting late and all that stuff. So he's like, okay. And then I put me there. Here it is. It's Sunday. I'm getting tired. We've done all this stuff. You know, I'm like, okay, everybody go home. Yeah. Get out of the church so I can Finally, go home. Just, yeah. Get out. <laughs> I'm done. I'm tired, right? Yeah. And then Jesus says, yeah, but just wait. We can help them. And I'm like, no, I don't want to help them. I want to go home, <laughs> you know? But then I look at it and then I say, but then what does he do after that? Um, and this is like a hard thing for me. This is like, and again, this question comes directly related to me um, because for me, what I'm learning is that the interruption is the ministry. That's when the ministry gets to happen. Yeah. Interruption to my day, right? My day is all just going fine and dandy and this and that. And then the phone rings. And then all of a sudden you're not in control anymore, right? Tim? Not in control. Something's going to want. It's not what you want to do. It's what you got to do. Yeah. yeah. Something's going to affect my schedule, you know, most people know I run a very, I schedule my day out um, in my evening and all that. And all of a sudden now I have to do this. Why? Because God has called me to do this, you know, and then I'll be crabby <laughs> while I do it, but I'll have a smile on my face. <laughs> um, but deep down I'll be like, Ooh, but then you when sound it like a nurse. What's that? You sound like a nurse. <laughs> we all, we have our schedule. It's all written down and it all has to go this way. But we're capable when things go outside the box of handling it, but we're annoyed and we have a smile on our face. I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just one of them things, right? But then for me, the interruption is the ministry, right? That's the part because why is that? Because for me, that's when I'm connecting with a person. That's when I'm caring for the sick, the lost, the hungry, the homeless. What is that? I never schedule that into my day. Are you kidding me? That stuff is horrible. It's time consuming and it's an emotional drain, but that's what it is. And what is he telling us? He's got a you know, he gets to feed 5,000 people, right? I may get to help too, you know. But um, those two are just as important as the 5,000. Yeah, right. So for me, it's kind of that, you know, and this is, again, a seven-year evolution that is taking me to get to this point um, to understand this. <laughs> um, so just saying, you know, seven years now, I, I mean, I didn't get this for like a long time. And I didn't even get it like in the beginning, you know, it takes a while of reading the same book of Matthew and the same stinking stories before it finally starts to sink in, you know, to change your heart. That's what it's all about. Um, so for me, it's to be able to see the chance to help because that's what an interruption is. Mm -hmm. um, you usually don't get interrupted with something that's good. Um, that's usually planned. Um, but then after the fact, you look back and say, wow, I, you know, by God's grace, I was able to do that. You know? So as much as I like to dodge interruptions, um, sometimes he doesn't give me that opportunity. Um, so a personal question then, um, cause that seems like, you know, the number of fish and bread that they have and how God was able to stretch that. Have you ever experienced God stretching your resources? And maybe you didn't see it at the time, but take a chance, right? And like, look back, look back in a little bit of history of your life and say, when did God really stretch my resources? 
maybe not as exponential as this Jesus feeds the 5,000, but no. um, nevertheless, it happens. Um, and it's just a way for us to kind of like look at that and say, even in my life, Jesus can do that. You know, God can do that. Um, then we move to like one of my favorite stories. Um, and I like his story the best. Um, Matthew's version. Um, yeah. Jesus walks on water. Um, mm -hmm. I listed um, Mark and John. We haven't read John yet, but, um, but we did read Mark and we talked about that. But compare and contrast those stories. I mean, all these dudes are in a boat at the same time. Right? Peter's Where's, the only I didn't know Peter walked on water. None of the other two books said anything about Peter. Yeah, right. So my favorite thing is like one of my favorite things to like um ask kids or anybody is to say, How many people do you know who can walk on water? And you know what the answer is? Everybody says one. Two. But in reality, it's two. And the fun thing is is when you tell them two, they're like, who? Right, so then you get then you get to tell them this story, and it's a real cool way of like doing that because it is this is it. It's the only other place, you know. Are you afraid to get out of the boat? Yep. Are you afraid to get out of the boat? Or question number five: Are you ready to step out of the boat? I could step out of the boat if I knew he would 100% allow me to walk on water. I know he can make me walk on water, but he doesn't always answer the way you want the answer. So maybe he'd make me sink to prove a point or have some parable after. <laughs> when you're at the well, bottom of the lake, right? It's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> um, Jesus didn't call you personally, huh? Yeah. To get out of the yeah. boat, huh? So, like he did with Peter. You know, it's yep. interesting. It's just like one of them things, right? You can allude this um, to to anything, not like literally walking on water, right? But what are you ready when God and Jesus calls you? Are you ready to step out and follow them on something that literally seems impossible? Because we know that walking on water is impossible. It's physically impossible. You can't do it in the summertime. I got to oh, yeah. <laughs> walk on water in the winter. But you can't because it's ice. So it's different. But like our, you know, that's physically impossible. But we read here that it's not if you are truly fixed on him. So the question is, when you are called to a task, that you, that you individually feel is impossible, are you ready to step out of the boat? That's like, this is, that's why this is like one of my favorite parts of like this story because it hits us because this, this fits my whole theory of why we read the Bible and discuss it with other people because it gives us this chance to like really reflect on this. You know, I'm not asking for an answer. I'm not asking for an example. What I'm asking is that it's like in your mind and that it's there. So when that time comes, and I'll tell you the first time for me was the first time I had to lead worship service and I had to do my first message. And I had to, I hate saying this, like I had to preach from the pulpit I was like, are you kidding me? This is impossible. I cannot do this. How'd you do? I don't know. I had my whole thing like all written out. It was three pages. I had PowerPoint slides. I had all that stuff. And when I got done with it, I don't even remember like really reading my script. Well, I was there, Tim, and I thought you did a wonderful, you, you gave a wonderful message. You remember. Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. 
What was it? I don't remember the topic. I just remember that. I was petrified, seemed, man. It was. It seemed so natural to you. You know, I mean, you didn't appear nervous. Um, you you gave your message just like you talk in Bible study or when someone when you and I are talking. You you were Tim. <laughs> you were Tim. Yeah. And see, that's why I think they make you wear robes when you do that stuff, because then no one can see how much you're shaking on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't help the sweat factor making you wear that polyester robe. Yeah, yeah. That's horrible. I can, I can kind of relate to what you're talking about, Tim. Um, when I, the time I participated in my first vocal recital, you know, um, getting up, we had it at a, a church and there was one other student and I that we were told by our teacher we were ready to do a recital. And we're like, no, we're not, <laughs> you know, and she Who's says, yes, you are. About? You need to do it. You need to do it. You need to get out there and open your mouth and just let the song come out. Yeah. And, uh, so it was a, it was um, it was a sick to your stomach kind of nervousness and fear, and when but once I did that, I realized I could do that, mm -hmm. and so now I ask to sing as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, and you know what I don't do? I don't ask to preach. <laughs> I know you don't. Still don't like to do that. <laughs> um, but but you're, that first time you did, Tim, it was kind of like your, you know, your children's messages. I love, I love both you and Bradley giving children's messages, and all, and it just seemed to me that all you, that really what you did <clears throat> was a message for the big kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah, it's like. Them kids don't get it. It's like the one chance I got to talk to the parents because they'll listen to me for like three or four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> then after that, then they're done. They're reading the bulletin again. So, but yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things. And his story is just that, right? When you truly focus on him, right? Anything is possible. Even when it seems impossible and the thing that still works for me today is when and if i have to do them messages um i do stop like right before i go out there and i say god please be with me and please help me say what needs to be said mm -hmm. um and then all the work that i've done up to that point gets thrown away and then something else comes out um, with a little bit of guidance from like all that. But it's scary to get out of the boat. Mm -hmm. But when you can walk with him, it's not. Um, and this is <clears throat> just, and the other cool thing is, is if when you're focused, Right? I just view this picture, right? He's really focused on Jesus. And the one thing, he, and he steps out of the boat. And he's like, one, two. And then he realized what he was doing was crazy. And he did fall. But the part that helps me <clears throat> is when you fall, he won't let you drown. <laughs> he won't yeah. let you drown. Yeah. He won't leave you down. He's going to literally pick you back up, you know? And to me, that's another huge comfort in the story that I don't think we should let go unknown, either. you know? And just be, um, yeah, he'll pick you up. So that, uh, <laughs> I think we made it, um, yeah. That ends 13 and 14.
So I'll close with a prayer, then we will go on our day. So please pray with me. Dear Gracious Father, we thank you for giving us people who wrote down Jesus' life and teaching so that we have the ability today to be able to allow that to guide our life as we live with Jesus as our focus and knowing that during times and when things seem impossible, we know that with our faith in Jesus, that he will walk with us, and when we fall, he will pick us up. Lord, we thank you for your perfect son, Jesus, our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.